Welcome to Unleash the Awesome with Dave Gambrill. All of us have unique skills, talents, and abilities that aren't being used to their full potential. Our mission is to share the people, tools, apps, and other resources that will help you unleash your awesome on the world. Yo, what's up? It's Dave. Welcome to another episode of Unleash the Awesome. Today, let's talk about how Lorne Michaels and Saturday Night Live can teach us some amazing things about success and making things happen. So if you happen to be living under a rock and you have no idea what Saturday Night Live is, it is a comedy show that's been going on in the United States, um, not every week because they only run it during certain times of the year, but it's been going on consistently pretty much without fail since October 11th, 1975 on Saturday nights at 11.30 p.m. Eastern Time. And they've had some of the most famous comedians and actors come through there that you would all know. People like Bill Murray and Seth Meyers and Jimmy Fallon and Maya Rudolph and Chris Rock and Andy Samberg and Kristen Wiig and back in the day, John Belushi and Dan Aykroyd and all kinds of people. And some people you probably wouldn't even know like that are some of the writers, but some of them have branched out and done their own things. And maybe they, they they're more of a household name now, like John Mulaney, Colin Jost, Michael Che, like all of these people, it's a super successful franchise. And maybe you don't love it because they poke fun at some of your beliefs or your political systems or whatever, but you cannot deny that it is one of the most successful television shows and really one of the most successful franchises of all time to be on TV for almost essentially this point, 50 years with the same guy at the helm, Lauren Michaels, right? That says something. That's that's amazing. Most shows don't make it one or two seasons on TV or on streaming or whatever. This show has been around for almost 50 years. It's, it's just amazing. And what it can teach us about making things happen, getting things done, success is they have a very specific framework for how they go about doing their week. So on the show, typically they have, uh, it's about an hour and a half, including commercials. So I don't know how much time that equates to for actual time, but they have about 90 minutes that they have to fill each Saturday night. They typically have a host that is usually like a movie star actor, somebody like that, or actress that uh, is well known. Sometimes it's a musician, but <clears throat> it's usually, you know, somebody that's like a, a headliner or, you know, a keynote type person, somebody that you recognize. So they have the host and then they usually have a musical guest. And sometimes the musical guest is also the host. That's happened before and there's all kinds of other interesting crossovers. But generally there's a host and a musical guest and then the ensemble of people that they have, the comedians and stuff that they have from Saturday Night Live. And each season there's different uh, people that are part of the cast and they come and go throughout the years. But generally... They have this host and the musical guest. And what happens is after they do their show on Saturday, right? I don't know exactly what they do on Sunday, but then Monday, the new week starts and they usually meet with, and, and I'm taking some liberty with this because I don't know exactly what it looks like, but generally this is the format that they follow to make things happen. Monday, they have a meeting with the host and they say, hey, you know, the, and the writers start meeting with the, the host for the upcoming week and they say, hey, here are some angles that we're looking at. Here are some things we're thinking about. Here are some jokes we're thinking about writing. Let's talk about boundaries. Is there anything that's totally out of the question and that you're not going to do? And then uh, let's talk about things for us that I think are should do and must do and let's figure it out, right? So they start kind of negotiating what the boundaries are and then they might even start offering up some jokes or some ideas or some thoughts to the host and there's some some back and forth there. They have some conversations and then Tuesday, the writing team starts actually submitting some jokes and there's some back and forth on some things that they want to do for the sketches and the skits that they want to run on Saturday. And so they, they stay up pretty late doing this stuff, sometimes pulling all nighters because uh, the writers are trying to create all this stuff. Right. And they got to create these, you know, four or five minute sketches that are going to go on TV. And then Wednesday comes and they have it refined a little bit more. They might have some idea of who the musical guest will be and if there's going to be any kind of crossover things because sometimes they shoot some videos that the musical guest is a part of or there are some gags or whatever that they're a part of. So now Wednesday rolls around. They have a better idea of the jokes. They have a better idea of kind of the sketches that are going to make it and the sketches they're actually going to write for 
and and fill out because at this point it's really just kind of top line like some ideas some some brainstorming just kind of throwing ideas at the wall um, but then I think Thursday I think it happens on Thursday is when they do their first table read which is the writers sit down with the host and Lauren Michaels who's the creator executive producer I think he wears every single hat at SNL and they sit down around a table and they do it's a table read right that's why it's called a table read they sit at the table and they read their jokes they read the sketches they read the ideas to the host and sometimes the host will kind of read their part of the sketches as well and they start to get a feel for the timing of the sketch whether or not the jokes are going to work how to you know rewrite it or whatever and that's where it really starts taking shape on Thursday and typically what they'll do is they'll write more sketches than are necessary which I'll talk about when we get to Saturday's schedule but Thursday is where it really starts happening and then I guess uh, I don't know this but I guess that's when also the stage production people start to figure out like what they need to create for the props and stuff on stage like what the backdrops and stuff are going to be so that's Thursday all right so we went Monday Tuesday Wednesday Thursday we're only a couple days away three days away or whatever from Saturday night and we still don't have stuff fully baked, but we're getting closer. Uh, Friday comes, and I think this is when they shoot some of those videos that they might show. Um, so they spend some time doing that. But then they really have the sketches pretty well figured out. And they might rehearse some of them. They might decide which ones are going to make the cut. And they write more than are necessary, and they create more than are necessary. I'll tell you why in a second. But Friday, it starts to get a good feel, but it's still not totally locked in. And they will rehearse the sketches, and sometimes Lauren makes the executive decision to say, oh, we're not doing that one, or we're definitely doing this one, or whatever the case may be. Yeah. So again, still not fully baked, still kind of, I don't know, maybe 80% there. And then they shoot some of the promos. You'll see sometimes the commercials and stuff, uh, so they can air them and say, hey, I'm the host this week on Saturday Night Live. Come watch. Sometimes they go do guest appearances on Jimmy Fallon or some other things, Um and then from there, we get to Saturday. And the way Saturday Night Live works on Saturday is they actually do two live shows. A lot of people don't know this. They do one show earlier in the day. I forget specifically what time. And the, the main reason I know this is I've been to a couple, um, I've been to a couple of Saturday Night Live live shootings. Uh, or live events or live whatever you want to call them and usually when you apply to get tickets they'll either give you tickets to the early show which is the rehearsal or you'll get tickets to the actual live show that starts at 11 30. Um, so the times that I've been I've actually been to the live show but I've been there early enough in the day to see what goes on and understand what goes on they basically do the whole show they do a dress rehearsal like a, a like a live run through in front of a live studio audience to try to get all the timing and everything down, but only once. And they do this on Saturday at roughly, I think it's like around 5 p.m. maybe, Eastern time, somewhere in there. Uh, and so they do a live run for like 90 minutes, and it might go a little bit longer because they do all of the sketches they think they're going to do for the live show, and then they might do a couple others just to see. And they get live crowd reactions, right? So they test it once in front of a live audience. They get live reactions from a live audience on everything they run the whole thing and then they make the decision some of these jokes are not working we're not going to include them and then they take the risk of putting a totally new joke in there that has no has not been tested in front of an audience but they're like well this one definitely didn't work so let's pull this or let's pull this sketch and we'll put this one in instead and then they usually keep a couple kind of on standby so that if they need to fill time or they know that if they need to pull some things for time they can do that as well because, again, they only have this 90-minute window to make this happen on Saturday night. And so they do this in front of a live audience. They do some tweaking and whatever. So now it's uh, 6, 6.30, right? They're going to go live at 11.30. So in this time span, they're making some changes. The writers are creating some new things. The people that have to write the cue cards, you know, have to edit the cue cards, whatever. They get it all lined up. The stage production team has to get things going. People have to work on getting the, the one audience out and the new audience run through security and then in the building. And if you happen to go on a day, which I did one time, where there is somebody that gets secret service protection, there's a whole other level of security that you have to go through. So somebody's coordinating that whole thing. And then the show goes live at 1130. So I've been explaining this all for like the last 10 minutes. 
right? I've condensed a whole week into 10 minutes <clears throat> and it sounds chaotic <clears throat> and it is. And then they go and they 1130 rolls around and they start the show, right? Live from New York, it's Saturday night and they're, they're here we go. And they do their, you know, their cold open. Then they do this, you know, live from New York and then they do the introduction, whatever. And then they're off and running and they do the whole show. And the reason why I was inspired to do this podcast is I heard somebody say that Lauren Michaels says, you're never ready to do the show. The show is never fully ready. There's always stuff we're still working on. Literally into the show, the writers and stuff are still writing jokes or changing things or whatever as the show is going on. He says, the show doesn't happen because it's ready. The show happens because it's Saturday night at 11.30. Let me say that again. Lauren Michaels says, Saturday Night Live does not happen each week because it's ready. The episode doesn't happen because it's ready. It happens because it's Saturday night at 11.30. The powerful thing for us as a takeaway is you're never going to be fully ready. Even the show that's been on TV for almost 50 years, won a ton of awards, they're not totally ready. They don't spend a million times rehearsing it. They rehearse it amongst themselves a couple times that week. They might do it in front of an audience once, and then they go, and they do it. And it's been very successful. It's a very successful format. So some takeaways for us is, first, have a framework. Right? Have an idea of how you're going to run your thing, how you're going to run your week, how you're going to set up your conference or write your book or whatever. Begin with the end in mind. Begin with 11.30 p.m. Eastern Time on Saturday night. Have an end goal in mind. Begin with the end in mind and work backwards. And then say, okay, what do I need to do? If I want to practice this or rehearse it once or twice, not rehearse it forever and never launch it. For somebody listening to this, that was just a punch in the gut, right? At some point, you have to launch it. So... Figure out what the date is, work backwards, put it, and have a framework for how you create your content and how you get out there. And be okay with when this time rolls around, we're going to launch this thing. We're going to put it out there. We're going to share it with the world. We might try it in front of a small audience first. We might do a Facebook Live. We might do a podcast episode to work it out. We might do some things in front of a smaller audience one time to get it out there and see. And then we're going to launch it out to the world. All right. So the takeaways are have a framework, right? Have a the first one is a have a framework. The second one is have a date to work to. So begin with the end of mind and work backwards and have benchmarks. And then the third thing is you then just do it. You don't do it because it's ready. You do it because it's eleven thirty on Saturday night or whatever your timeline is, whatever your date is. All right. You've heard probably a lot of people say things like, uh, "It's just a dream. It's not a goal. It's just a dream." until you have a date, until you have a target date, right? It doesn't become a goal until you have a date on the calendar and you start working for that specific thing. Or you hear somebody say things like, uh, I'll do it someday. I'll get around to it someday. Someday I'll write a book, someday, whatever. And you'll hear me say, listen, stop living on someday aisle. <laughs> someday I'll do this. Someday I'll do that. No, pick a date. And, you know, you can give yourself some leeway. It doesn't have to be like, I'm going to do it this Saturday night at 1130 when, you know, I happen to be recording this podcast on a Thursday. That would only give you a few days to do it. Like, give yourself a semi-realistic timeline. You probably want to be aggressive with it, though, because of the law of diminishing intent. Right? If you think about doing something, you want to do it, and you believe in it, and then you put that deadline too far out, then the further you get away from when you actually set that deadline, the more likely it is for you to be like, eh, do I really want to do this? So if it's something you really want to do, set an aggressive timeline for it and then get after it. And besides Lauren Michael, there's a plenty of people in uh, business and entrepreneurship that I know that do a similar thing. One of my mentors, and he's become a friend of mine, Russell Brunson, who is the co-founder of ClickFunnels. He's written a ton of books, uh, Expert Secrets, dot com Secrets, Traffic Secrets. He's got a lot of things going on in his world. He owns a bunch of other businesses now. He's got a family with small kids, and he coaches them in wrestling and all this stuff. Super busy guy, right? He still operates out of this idea of he sets a date and then just has to work to it, and he does it. He just makes it happen. So even when he has his premier conference and live event that he's got that usually happens, it used to happen in February, but now it's 
happening in the September timeframe generally, and I'll be at this year's. Hopefully you'll come join me at Funnel Hacking Live in Orlando. I'll put the link in the comments or in the show notes so you can get access to it. But I'm already booked and I'll be there for it this year. But for Funnel Hacking Live, which he speaks on stage at this conference every day of the conference, and there's great keynote speakers this year. There's some really amazing people coming, Ed Milet, Brendan Burchard, a bunch of other folks. Um, but Russell speaks from stage as well. And you'll see if you follow him on Instagram or I'm in some of his coaching programs or some other places, you'll see that he know you know, he has to do like five or seven or eight presentations of Funnel Hacking Live. And just a few days out, he'll be like, I'm just finishing up my slides or I just started my slides for this one presentation. Now, that doesn't mean he's waited to the last minute. That doesn't mean that he's totally procrastinated. And it's probably the same thing for you. You probably have the content inside you. You've probably thought about your presentation. You've probably thought about your podcast episodes. You've probably thought about the chapters of the book you want to put out there. You probably have been rehearsing this stuff in the shower or saying it to yourself out loud as you drive on your commute to your job that you don't like. You probably have thought through a lot of the things that you haven't put out in the world yet. So Russell's done a lot of that, right? And he's tested it in some other things. And I'm going to a smaller event here uh, in just a couple weeks, actually, in June with him where and, you know, there'll be a couple hundred people, not a few thousand. And I know for a fact, because he tells us this, he'll try out some of his content, just like Saturday Night Live. This will be like a live audience for him to try out some of his content that he thinks he's going to share at Funnel Hacking Live in front of thousands, five, seven thousand people. And he'll get some feedback from people that he trusts, like people that already know what he's trying to do. Uh, so he'll do it there. And then, you know, he'll work on his slides going into the thing. And he's got a team now that a uh, shout out to my friend Jake Leslie, who does a lot of the stuff behind the scenes for him to put it together at the last second. But my point of sharing the story about Russell is he operates the same way Lauren Michaels works for Saturday Night Live. And it's been successful for Ru Russell. It's been successful for Lauren. Uh, I tend to do the same thing. And I'm reading this book. I'll put this in the show notes for you as well. It's called Scarcity. Can't remember the uh, authors, but they talk about the same thing of like when there is a deadline, when there's a like a, essentially a drop dead date, like people tend to take action. And sometimes that's why people will wait to the last minute and pull an all nighter or whatever, which is not what I'm recommending. But when you have specific dates, when you have benchmarks, when you have things to work towards, then you tend to work towards them because you feel there's an implied scarcity of time. Like I just don't have enough time. But if you're living on someday aisle, someday I'll do this, like you'll never do it. Right? If you someday I'll write a book. You'll never write it. But if you say, I'm going to write a book by the end of 2022 or 2023 or whatever, and then you put that date on the calendar, I'm going to launch it on October 1st, let's just say 2022 this year that I'm recording this podcast. Then you look at that and you're like, whoa, okay, so what does that mean? If I'm going to you know, put it on Amazon, uh, Kindle Direct Publishing, or you know, however you're going to self-publish it, or maybe you want to have a deal. If you're going to have a deal with a publisher, you're going to have a longer timeline. But if you want to like self-publish it through one of these other channels, then, you know, you say, okay, I'm going to do it October. So what that means is looking backwards, then I have to have the book figured out and written by who knows, probably end of September to then get it in the hands of an editor. You can find them on Fiverr or some other places. And then you're going to want somebody to do your cover art. And then if you want, need to purchase ISBN numbers, if you're not going to take the one from Kindle and then all these things, then like you, there'll be a whole month, maybe more. And, no, and I know this is an aggressive timeline in, in terms of finishing the actual manuscript and getting it edited and then getting the cover art and then getting it submitted to Kindle and whatever or Amazon. And even if you're going to do it's called Kindle Direct Publishing, but you can not only have a Kindle version, like an e-reader version, but you can have paperbacks and even hardbacks now through there. So maybe you have to finish it by September for it to get out in October. And then if you're going to do all the publicity stuff that goes with it, right? Then there's a whole nother timeline you need to figure out. But when you put it on the calendar, when Russell knows he has to give presentations at Funnel Hockey Live on September, or whatever it is this year, 20 something, like then he knows he's got to do it. There's no other choice. You don't have a choice. When 1130 rolls around on Saturday night for Saturday Night Live, they don't have a choice to not do it. They can't just let the air be, be dark on NBC, right? They have uh, advertisers and stuff that want to run their commercials and, and, put in front of a huge audience, which, which is what Saturday Night Live will draw. So for you, I'd encourage you to look at your things. Are you beginning with the end in mind? Are you setting deadlines? And do you have timelines? Do you have benchmarks? And then are you committed to actually doing it instead of kicking the can down the road forever? Which is what happens, unfortunately, to a lot of people and their big ideas and their big dreams. It's just they don't have a framework to, to attack it, and they don't have a specific end date in mind.
So I hope these stories about Lauren Michaels and Saturday Night Live and Russell Brunson and some of these other things have helped you understand how you can get some of your big pro- projects out to the world so you can help unleash your awesome and unleash the awesome of others through your work. All right. So until next time, go unleash your awesome on the world. And if you like this podcast, please tell a friend about it. I'd appreciate it. See you. Thanks for listening to Unleash the Awesome. Please be sure to subscribe, rate, and review wherever you listen to your podcasts. And please share us on your favorite social media platforms using hashtag UnleashAwesome.